According to the story, a group of people migrated into the land of Shinar and attempted to build a tower to make a name for themselves until God came down and confused their languages and then they dispersed from the city. But was this tower actually built or was it just a myth created by later Jewish authors? When most people hear of the Tower of Babel, they think of this image, some sort of circular tower being constructed in order to reach the clouds, hundreds of meters high. But the truth is this image came from a 16th century painter from the Netherlands who had no knowledge of the ancient Near East. So this type of tower probably never existed. The real Tower of Babel was probably something else entirely. Genesis 11 reminds us that this event is happening in the land of Sumer, or as the Hebrews call it, Shinar. In ancient Sumer, cities were built around large religious structures called ziggurats. Ziggurats were sort of large structures with a raised platform and meant to be the highest object in the city. Many scholars believe they were meant to function as a gateway for the gods to come down to earth from the heavens. They probably were not meant for religious ceremonies which would have been conducted in nearby temples. Instead, they were more about connecting the heavens and the earth via the stairways on the ziggurats. For example, the ziggurat at Babylon was given a title that means the foundations of heaven and earth. The one at Larsa meant temple that links heaven and earth, and the one at Sippor meant stairway to pure heaven. Now in Hebrew, there is no word for ziggurat, nor were there any ziggurats built in Canaan. The word they use for tower is a general word that can really refer to any large structure. So the Hebrew authors are referring to a large structure that a city was built around in the land of Sumer. The obvious and most likely structure in mind is an ancient Sumerian ziggurat. Thus, the Tower of Babel was probably the ziggurat of Babel. Now the next question should be, is when was this tower or ziggurat of Babel built and where? There are some interesting correlations in the text that help us to place the time period for the Tower of Babel and strengthen the reliability of the biblical account. First, it said they made bricks by burning them. In ancient Mesopotamia, fired brick technology was probably developed around the end of the 5th millennium BC. Such bricks did really not exist in Canaan because they did not need them due to the availability of stones and other building materials. In southern Mesopotamia, large stones were not as available, and so out of necessity, fired bricks were developed in order to build temples and other large structures. Thus, the Hebrew authors get the building material correct, even though it was not present in their own region. Second, Genesis 11 records the tower was supposed to have its tops in the heavens. This description matches how Mesopotamian texts speak of ziggurats, John Walton says, Throughout Mesopotamian literature, almost every occurrence of the expression describing a building with its head in the heavens refers to a temple with a ziggurat. For example, here's a description by Warad Sin, king of Larsa. He made it as high as a mountain and made its head touch heaven. On account of this deed, the gods Nana and Megal rejoiced. Third, Genesis 11 says the tower was built after people migrated from the east. Now this could possibly be a reference to the... Now this is making more sense. This is making more sense now. So he wasn't trying to fight the Most High. So I was right about that, like I said. However, he built this tower, which actually, when you find out what it was, it was a place to serve fallen ones. And at first they were gonna leave the fallen ones alone. And they want they were honestly want they want to leave the most high alone too, although the most high the spirits, so I don't understand how they thought they was gonna do that. But they did. And they was being, you know, from, I, from what I understand from the research I've done, they were just being cool for a while, but then somebody got the idea of uh of uh Gilgamesh, if you look up his real name, you see it's Mr. N as well but and um also 
He was saying stories. He was fighting a lion and all the stuff. He was half human, half Nephilim. Okay, but um, to make just to, just to speed this up, uh, eventually they got the idea to he wanted he thought about them getting them to try to serve him. Um, at least that's what the story says in the Bible. But in the story I read. It doesn't seem to say that he wanted them to serve him. It was starting to say that they wanted to serve the uh, some of the fallen ones. And Gilgamesh being a half Nephilim, half man, there of course that he knew about the fallen ones. But uh, when he built the tower, it also describes him shooting at the. Uh, they try to say he's shooting at the Most High. But Most High the Spirit, and, and, and he knows that he could not beat the Most High. So Gilgamesh wouldn't be fighting, shooting at the Most High. Gilgamesh is shooting at another fallen one. Most likely, most likely the top fallen one. Okay? And he was serving lower fallen ones. Either way, they're all devils. He start, they started serving lower devils, and they ended up fighting the highest devil. And that's why I tell you, when you read your Bible, you might want to think about uh, which you're really reading because it's not really telling you the whole truth. Gilgamesh knew very well there's no way to fight the Most High. You cannot shoot the Most High with arrows and missiles. So why was he shooting in the sky? He was shooting at the devil's spaceship. Okay? Although he still was serving other devils. See, men back in the days of mankind would make deals with these devils who were in the physical realm for protection. And that's why you see these, all these things telling you what to do. I keep telling you, you need to do further research so you find out who was telling who what to do. Because sometimes it was devils telling our people what to do. It wasn't always the Most High dealing with them by the Spirit, which is supposed to be in you, because you're supposed to be a portion of the Most High, because you are the Spirit. The soul is the body. But most of you understand that, and you look to praise a man or creation when the Most High told you not to do that. The Most High is not creation. And the Most High told you not to serve creation. But you did it anyway. The proto-Sumerians arriving in Just like him. Some scholars think the Sumerians originated in the region. But that is unlikely. Their language is totally unlike the surrounding regional languages. Karen Ray in the Jot notes, Sumerian is not related to any language, living or dead. Jean Batero also notes an ancient text called the Myth of the Seven Sages, according to which the southern population, which was still rough-hewn and wild, had been initiated into all that constituted civilized life by strange people. And he also was dealing with the devils of the outside nations. So they make it seem like this guy was part of it once in the Bible. They don't explain that he's an outside nation. But yeah he, yeah, he was part outside nation. They was dealing with devils. And Samaria took us into captivity at one point, too. Beings who came by the sea. So it appears the Sumerian culture probably began after a slow migration of new people into the region. Amitnijat thinks the Sumerian culture appeared in Mesopotamia around the end of the 4th millennium B.C., which was also during the Uruk period. George wrote, Sumeria? Sumerians were created by the fallen ones and the Anunnaki. So was a lot of other groups y'all try to say that's us, that's not us. And they were created by the fallen ones as well. So they served who they were created by. That's why the Bible is what you call is really the book of the dead, because it's talking about their deities. Okay? Only they put a little bit of our stuff in there. And the main thing they stick in that is that you should know this is don't serve anybody else, but also um, uh, the, the Moshe, who they call Moses in the Bible, which Moses is a demonic name. If you look up Moses, you find out some demonic shit. Look up Moshe, you find out Moshe was the real prophet. But let's get straight to it. Uh, Moshe was the only one that believed, and the first one to believe. You ready for this? And what they saying, oh, they mix up a lot of stories between Moshe, King David, and a whole bunch of other guys. That the Most High was a spirit, and still is, and could never be seen. Bam! Hey, but I also didn't believe that, though. But that's what the Israelites, that's what we supposed to believe. 
that the Most High is a spirit and can never be seen. Okay? You cannot touch, feel the Most, you can feel him, but you can't touch him. God stop saying, you can't touch the Most High, you can't even see the Most High. Alright? Okay? You can't see a spirit. You can feel the Most High's power, but you better be careful whose power it is, because sometimes the devil can make you feel power too. Suggest between 3200 BC and 3500 BC. Some scholars place the arrival of the Sumerians a little further back, but they probably at least arrived sometime after the Ube period, and then conquered the region and its inhabitants, bringing with them their unique and obscure language. This probably didn't happen all at once, and was probably a gradual migration, and the people that migrated in mixed with the locals to produce what we now know as ancient Sumer. But it is possible the biblical authors also allude to this migration, saying they came from the east and then took over the region. The urbanization of southern Mesopotamia also seems to have begun around this time. Now the text of Genesis 11 seems to be talking about the beginning of this time period. That is, when people arrived from the east, shortly after the invention of fired bricks, and the beginning of urbanization. So based on the external evidence, Genesis 11 seems to be talking about an event that happened during the 4th millennium BC and not any later construction of ziggurats or cities. The time period was called the Arut period, or the Proto-Literate period, as it was the period just before the invention of writing. However, if this is the case, then it creates a problem, as it is often assumed the Tower of Babel refers to the city of Babylon, which wasn't established until the beginning of the second millennium BC. But interestingly enough, other ancient texts speak of Babylon existing in ancient times before the second millennium BC. The reason for this is because Babylon and the ancient city of Eridu were often equated. For example, the cities are equated by Barossus when he says the ancient king Alaros reigned in Babylon, whereas the kingless refer to this as Eridu. The toponym for Eridu was also used of Babylon. A.R. George lists several early texts that equate Eridu and Babylon and indicate the traditions of Eridu seem to become the traditions of Babylon. In one creation myth, Ea establishes his temple as a Gil when Eridu was built, but then the text calls the city Babylon. Thus it seems Babylon was seen as the new Eridu, and Eridu was seen as the ancient version of Babylon. So the Babel of Genesis 11 is probably a reference to Eridu, not the later new Babylon, established in the second millennium BC, after the decline of Eridu had already happened. So if we're going to look for the Tower of Babel in the fourth millennium BC, Eridu is the most likely place, and the ziggurat constructed there is the most likely candidate. Now Genesis 11 says that after they built the ziggurat, God came down and confused their languages, and they left from building the city. <coughs> Site. The final temple was constructed in the Uruk period, or 4th millennium BC, and referred to as Temple 1 and Temple 2. However, after this, the city was suddenly and abruptly abandoned, and was never restored to its former glory. Gwendolyn leaks it. So the temple that they made in Babel was to another deity. And Babel was Syria. Syria and Babel, they were serving a different deity. They remember the Assyrians were heathen and Gentile. The Assyrians, um, at that time, the most of the, so all the heathen and Gentile are supposed to be serving Rome. Their, I'm not, y'all shouldn't serve him. Their creator is the ruler over the earth. Okay? Because he stole that shit, quite frankly. Alright? And he, he's evil. Alright? And one was given authority as well, because it's two different guys over the earth. Except, you know, they beefed over it. Look up the Palladium and Draco Wars. You'll find out a whole lot of shit the, the more you dig into it. It's, I ain't gonna lie, it's, it's not always easy to find. 
they, you know, this, this, this stuff they try to hide. It's even hard to find on YouTube for some fucking reason. So, but I've been finding other places. It used to be easy to find. You know, years ago. So you know, they've been hiding a lot of stuff. But uh, because they didn't want to serve their double, and they served some another double, their double punished them. Uh, 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 Mr. N was trying to fight their head double they used to be serving. They didn't want to serve him, and they chose another double. But they didn't understand, and that's why we didn't say, you, you, you know, not who you serve. Uh, you're supposed to be, we're supposed to serve almost high, the spirit. Not the physical head double that they were serving at one time, and that, then, of course, they refused to serve, and they got destroyed by that same head double. See, the most high, who is the spirit, well, if you want to deal with these head doubles or serve them or call on their names because you create that soul tie, the most high will let the lower doubles or whatever level double they are or head double have their way with you, sometimes to a certain extent, okay? So that's why I keep trying to tell you all avoid the names. And the reason they got the story is they made, they made the tower of Babel. That was a remake. It was called a different name before. And that's why the Most High allowed them. Since y'all want to make a tower to them and serve them, then you know what? Then just go ahead. That's y'all want to do. Do it do y'all. Don't look at don't look for me to help you though. You know what I'm saying? It says almost overnight, Eridu was completely abandoned, quickly buried under enormous drifts of sand that filled the deserted buildings. <coughs> It was only the main mount left standing. The temple itself was rebuilt twice in the proto-literate period, like an island in the desert. But the accumulation of loose sand seems to have made the area surrounding the main mount uninhabitable. When after some centuries, the area was once more inhabited, the population chose another spot, about a kilometer to the north, and few efforts were made to rebuild the shrine on the main mound. The site only became important again in the early dynastic <laughs> In other words, the city of Eridu was abandoned during the Aru period, even though the cultic site was still in use after. Another archaeological survey by Henry Wright records that the later periods after the Aru period show little evidence of occupation. It is unfortunate that the Jemdet Nassar and early dynastic three complexes are indicated primarily by the absence of things, for it is difficult to establish their presence unless they form the dominant complex on a site. Fuad Safar agrees. This was the situation at Eridu during the first half of the Uruk period, which appears to have been brought to a conclusion by no less an event than the total abandonment of the site. In other words, the archaeological data suggests Eridu was suddenly abandoned during the time period of Temple 1, and the ziggurat structure was only fully restored later during the Earth Third Dynasty. The evidence shows the combinations of Temple 1 and Temple 2 created a massive structure in the center of Eridu, dedicated to the god Enki, also called Ea. Safar also notes there is evidence the structure was built with baked bricks. Then, the evidence suggests during the 4th millennium BC, or the Uruk period, Eridu was suddenly abandoned, leaving this massive ziggurat complex behind. Then what we see is that later kings, during the Ur Third Dynasty, rebuilt over this ziggurat and added to the overall complex. Now if you do your research, you will find that Safar notes the temple and the ziggurat complex that was at Eridu was not abandoned as long as the city was. In other words, we have evidence the ziggurat complex was utilized after the city was abandoned at various times, later in the proto-literate period, up until the time of the Third Dynasty, when Amar Sin restored it. But this seems to be what Genesis 11 says. Genesis says they left off from building the city, not necessarily the Ziggurat itself. In verse 5, Genesis notes that God came down after the Ziggurat was already built, and then they were dispersed, and they stopped building the city and abandoned it. 
It doesn't say the Tower of Babel was never completed. In the archaeological record, for some odd reason, the city of Eridu was abandoned, even though the Ziggurat complex was still in use by a small northern settlement. Then, the Urther dynasty. Do y'all see what the, the pattern? People who serve the spirit of who is the most high first, then y'all serve all these idols, not realizing that y'all really serve the devils. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the first one, of course, we're just calling it the first name, because there were three different Tower Babels, obviously. Uh, you know, there, it's the E came down, and they dipped. Uh, when he came in a spaceship, he destroyed that city. So they all left. They don't tell him what he did to them, right? And then what happens again? Another tower. Same thing happens. Then another tower. Same thing happens. Now he and he's just breaking it down because there's three different towers. So a Babel, but different names. And they all come on what? Making a temple to who? The devil. And what the devil do? after they finally get them to serve him. Or if they don't want to serve him, they serve other devils. He come down on the ship and destroy them. What y'all do in the United States and all over the world? Serving those devils. What do you think they're going to do to y'all? Think about it. Later came and restored the Ziggurat and Temple because the whole complex fell under ruin. Leak notes the city itself was only treated as a cultic site from here on out. It was never seen as a fully fledged city again. Religious and economic centers slowly were moved to other cities, like Babylon or the city of Ur. In other words, Eridu was habited, but only for religious reasons, until it was fully abandoned during the Neo Babylonian Empire. And it was never fully restored to its former greatness, like it was in the Proto Lyric period. On top of this, even though the Ziggurat complex was still in use later during the proto lyric period, so far it does note that the Ziggurat complex did fall into ruin because it was temporarily abandoned for a shorter time when the city itself was abandoned. So basically, the evidence suggests that when the city was suddenly left abandoned during the Arup period, the Ziggurat complex itself was also abandoned temporarily, but a northern settlement began to utilize it again and repaved some parts. Then, the third dynasty of Ur fully restored the Ziggurat complex and built on top of it. But all this seems to be a pretty strong correlation to what Genesis 11 records happened. An older city, also known as Babel, constructed a massive Ziggurat from fired bricks, <coughs> and then the site was suddenly abandoned and was never restored to its former glory. Even though a later new city of Babel was established at a different location. Now, correlations alone do not prove the event recorded in Genesis 11 happened. However, it also cannot be presupposed the Tower of Babel was just a mythic invention meant to attack Babylon during the Jewish exile. The text of Genesis 11 is written in a way that is describing a real event in the past. It could have been used in a way to attack the later empire of Babylon but the authors seem to be using an historical event in the past, not inventing a legend whole cloth. And given the archaeological data, it very well could have happened during the Arut period, which the later city of Babylon claims to have descended from. So despite the critics, we do have good evidence the Tower of Babel's story could have been a real historical event that took place in the proto-literate period. Last, what about the languages being confused? Well, this would be hard to prove archaeologically speaking, since it happened at a time before written records. Some have told me privately that because Sumerian isn't related to other languages, living or dead, it could have been a result of the languages being confused by God. Now, I guess this is possible, but as of now, I'm not willing to take this route. The text of Genesis 11 says they dispersed from the region and moved out. So each group is probably untraceable and would have blended in with whatever culture they assimilated into. The only other text that might hint to this event is the Sumerian epic called the Nimrkar and the Lord of Arata. Some scholars believe this text is talking about a future event when everyone will worship Enlil with one tongue. 
that Samuel Noah Kramer believed this text was referring to a time in the past when all the people worshipped Enlil with one tongue until his rival, the god Enki, came down and confused the languages. Enki was the patron deity of Eridu, which is referred to in the text. It also speaks of a Nemercar wanting to build the massive ziggurat at Eridu, and that it will be a holy mountain and an abode for the gods. So the text does make reference to Eridu, but this is all contingent on the idea that Kramer's translation is the correct one, which we have to acknowledge is disputed. However, even without this, we still do have good evidence the event described in Genesis 11 was describing a real historical event that seems to have... Well, of course it's disputed because the King James Bible is filled with mixtures of stories and lies and a little bit of truth. So now you got the truth about the Tower of Babel that they were serving devils. Okay? They were serving devils. Same like people now. And the day, same devils they serving came down and destroyed them. See, the devil liked to give you little trinkets and toys and promise you for, to have you conquer and become great and put you on top of everybody else. And he'll do that. But at what cost, though? Stop making deals with the devil. Stop serving him. Don't get you nowhere. And the glory he gives you is temporary. Because it's all to play you after he showed everybody that, you know what I'm saying, he can give you shit on this earth, then he take it away and take your soul. Because that's the price you pay. What happened at Old Babel, or Eridu, the city of Enki. New people migrated into the area, built a large ziggurat complex that utilized fired bricks. Then the city was suddenly abandoned, and a Sumerian epic might allude to Enki confusing the languages. Thus, given the data, the Tower of Babel incident, as recorded in Genesis, correlates well with an event that happened in Mesopotamia's past. And now you learn also maybe people didn't all speak the same language. Maybe that was only certain people that spoke the same language who were serving devils. See, so you have to start realizing that something's up. And everything in that Bible that you're reading ain't 100% ain't correct. Shalom.